okay. I think it's good. Okay. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. And it's my great honor to be here. And thanks for having me. And first, let me introduce a little bit about myself. So, yeah. My name is Anthony Fu. And I'm a coding member of Vit, Vue, and Nux. And also the creator of Vitas, uh, Slide Dev, Uno CSS, Type Challenges, uh, if you have heard about it. And Elk is a Mastodon client. I'm currently working at Nux Lab on the framework team. So with that, I got the pleasure to work on the Nux framework and doing open source full time. So you can find me on, uh, with a link. Uh, I have a website, ntfu.me. And yeah, so as you see, I'm pretty much from the Vue community. And it's actually my first time attending a React conference. And so it's a, great, it's a great honor to speak and share my perspective here with you. And even though my talk is probably the least uh, React talk today, I hope you find it useful at some extent. And so here's the deal. Um, I will try to talk about something you might find interesting. And you're going to teach me how to probably use UC fact later on. <laughs> so uh, as you see, uh, I'm working on multiple open source and create a few uh, that you might already be using. Uh, for example, like VTest, the, testing, the unit testing framework. So as someone who has been working on open source uh, while making a living uh, in a, in a, in a some extent, and I have to say that open source is so much fun and rewarding. I believe that many of you want to contribute to open source or already doing so. So, however, there are so many factors that affect if an open source project would work out or not. Uh, would it become uh, like popular or successful? But also depends on how you define it. For example, the quality of code, the documentation, the community, the marketing, and so on. All of them are very important and related to each other. And there isn't really a golden rule to say that's you, how you can make open source projects successful. So here, um, I'd like to share some of my experience and ideas on creating and maintaining open source projects, um, combining with some observations that I have learned from the community. And hopefully, it can um, help you to start with your own open source journey or find some ideas to improve your existing project. Open source is a quite a big topic, and I cannot really cover everything in one talk. And so I'm trying to break it down and to talk about different aspects and of open source in each talk and make them a theory. So today is the part one. Uh, it's called the set theory. Uh, I know this sounds a little bit random, and that's, you might wonder, that, what does that mean? Um, let me try to explain. So um, let's say uh, we already have an open source project or planning to create one. So to be a little bit practical, uh, to say that we might want to gain a certain amount of adoption, or that we just want more people to use it and enjoy our hard work. So uh, one thing to consider is how we picture our target users. For example, is my tool for, for the end users or for developers? Is it for Vue developers or for React, et cetera? We know that the fact that amongst all of our target users, only a portion of them will become our actual user. In order to get more users to our project, we have to try to convert more potential users to the actual user, maybe by doing more marketing or polishing. Or in that case, the amount of target users uh, actually becomes the limited, the upper limit of how many actual users we could possibly have. But on the other hand, we could try to find a way to expand our target user to include more people. And naturally, you will also have more converted users from it. Under this idea, let's take uh, some example to see how we could do that. And the first example I'm going to show you is actually my first open source project back in 2019. Uh, the project is called VS Code Vue i18 Alley. It's a Vue it's a VS Code extension to help Vue developers work on i 18 or so-called internationalization, and like preview the translations in code or manage keys for each language, et cetera. So this is a screenshot uh, of the extension that shows the basic feature. Uh, well, the extension itself is, is not our main topic today. I hope this screenshot can give you a basic idea of what it is. And at the beginning of this project, I was eager to 
uh, make this project popular because I really want to pull myself in open source. I was super happy when I got the first 100 and 200 stars and received the appreciation from the community. But after that, I started to seek for higher goals. And back then, I was um, dreaming to be a full-time open source, uh, to be working on full-time on open source, like, for example, like even you, the creator of Vue. So my ambition was to make something as popular as Vue. Uh, yeah, and then suddenly, I saw the fundamental difference between my project and Vue. And they directly reflects on the project name. So you look at that name. Um, we can see this quite long and composed by multiple words. And let's break it down and to see it part by part. So first, this is a VS Code extension. So that basically means that only VS Code user would use this extension. And we can draw a circle to indicating um, the VS Code user here. And then we have a view. And because it's uh, also based on my need, uh, so I created for view. And then we could have a view circle here. And finally, it's a, it's a helper for interna internationalization, meaning that not all view users would going, to use, would going to need this extension. So we could draw another circle for i18. Then we quickly find out that our target users are limited inside this intersection of these three set circles, and meaning that only a view developer who is working on editing app that happened to choose VS Code as their editor would ever try this extension. That sounds quite limited. And I would call this phenomenon as a set intersection. And before we dive into the solution, uh, maybe let's take a look at this graph and to see what the, the other intersection means. And we soon realize that the intersection between Vue and VS Code uh, is, the, is Vola or Vitor at that time. It's the VS Code IDE support for Vue. As a result, we, we know that both uh, Vitor and Vola uh, has a huge user base because both Vue and VS Code has a huge community, making the intersection large enough. And similarly, we see the inter intersection between Vue and i18 as a project like Vue i18, which is also super popular. And then it comes to the intersection between VS Code and i18. We see there seems to be not so much project at that time. So a straightforward thinking, like how about that speed that one, right? So in practice, uh, we can try to make the extension decouple from Vue so that it can work, uh, it can be used for the other framework as well. So in short, we might be able to make things more universal uh, by breaking the set circles and expand the in intersection. So that's how I did it. Uh, I took time to do a huge refactor. Um, I designed the in plugin interface and made the core uh, features universal. At, uh, at version 1.0, I renamed the package, uh, the project from Vue i18 Alley to i18 Alley. Uh, from a Vue only extension to a universal i18 helper for VS Code to support a wider range of framework, and including backend framework like Laruva, Ruby on Rails, or even native targeting frameworks. And they are also customizable and extendable on the user land. So when it comes to number, uh, we can see a steep increase at the stars uh, at the time we're doing the release. Uh, the star almost doubles uh, within a month. And that really means a lot to me uh, at that time, especially for me, uh, who is just get, it, get started in open source. And the thinking of making things universal really changed the way I work in open source later on. So to have another example, let's talk about Vite. And initially, Vite was an experiment on developing tool for Vue uh, when Avon first started. And when the idea seemed to work quite well, Avon decided to make it as a framework ag agnostic by extracting the Vue handling, uh, Vue specific handling into a plugin and to polishing the plugin API. And then we have the Vite we know today, the shared infrastructure under so many frameworks. So I'd say, uh, Vite success turns out to be far beyond my initial imagination. Now we have an incredible huge community and ecosystem. Basically, all modern frameworks are built on top of it. We have Savelkit, Storybook, Astro, Solistar, Nux, Quick City, and many more. And we're also very glad to welcome Remix to join the party recently. The collaboration across multiple frameworks and communities are really impressive. Uh, Vite becomes the shared core logic for the web tooling, so many meta frameworks uh, don't need to worry about the underlying details and can focus more on the, future, on the features and the capability the framework could provide. 
And when any improvements made in Vite, it also benefits all the downstream framework. And that truly makes the web better together. Here are many factors that makes V to reach it what it is today, but I would say that being extendable and agnostic really widen the door for the other community to join and contribute. And yeah, one more example uh, that I can think is a uh, React query. And they start with a query for React and also then provide a view version called view query. And as more meta frameworks like Svelte and Solid come into the game, I believe they realize that there could be something more generalized. And at some point, we see that view query has been merged into React query into a single repo and widen the sco scope to rename it to 10 stack query. And with a more universal solution, and it also works for more uh, framework as well. According to their documentation, today we, we see that Solid, Svelte, and Angular are also supported. Tenstack seems to be trying to expand this idea even further um, by providing more universal building blocks like a router and headless components. So kudos to them. So by making our project more universal, making, uh, making we could reach out a large user base and naturally we will have a more contributor to, to join the force and work together. So trying to refactor things become universal could also help us to revise our design and abstraction, and also it could end up with a more maintainable and extendable architecture. And finally, if your project started to gain more usage from various needs, making improvements to our project could also end up benefit anyone, uh, everyone in the ecosystem. So that's, I really encourage library authors to think more about that way and trying to seek for collaborations even across ecosystems. Yeah. So we know that being universal has a great benefit. Um, however, actually, I won't say that is like being specific is not a bad thing. Uh, specific allows us to provide a tighter integration and a better developer experience. But yeah, um, how could balance that? So for example, <laughs> another example, yeah. Uh, when we talk about server-side rendering and server APIs, we know that there are um, uh, there, uh, in those cases, we need a server uh, in some form to work together with our front end. So let's take Nux, uh, a view meta framework that I've been working on as, as an example. Um, other than self-host your own Node.js server, uh, there are so many hosting services out there, for example, like Cloudflare, Vercel, Netify, et cetera. And in Nux, we don't want our user to be stuck on a single platform, but rather we want to offer choice for our users to pick based on their need. To leverage the full potential of each provider, we may want to utilize the, the age rendering and serverless functions based on what they have offered. And one thing to note is each provide, uh, each of them have a different formats on defining the, the serverless functions. So we may have to, uh, like some also come up with uh, some specific tooling uh, in order to handle their environment. That means Nux would need to support as many uh, platforms as possible built in in order to, uh, to achieve our vision. So we made the integration and even support auto detection so that uh, the app you were written can be isomorphically and deployed to various platforms without, uh, without even changing any configuration. And then we, were, we, were, uh, we realized that there's a problem that probably every meta framework has to deal with. And it doesn't need to be views, uh, it doesn't need to be NUX specific. So we extract them as a standalone tool called Nitrum. It's a universal server builder, and it's pretty much like Vite, but for servers. And with Nitrum taking care of the details of dealing with servers, and it actually allows NUX to have a more clear architecture to handling view specific server side render or API, et cetera. And since Nitrum is a general purpose server, server tools, um, we see more and more meta frameworks start to use it and collaborate with us. We have Analog, uh, a popular Angular meta framework has migrated to Nitrum a few months ago, and then they just announced view, uh, version 1.0 release last week. Um, Stack, a new, meta, uh, a new framework agnostic uh, meta framework. And then we also have Solid Start, a meta framework from the, from the Solid team. And even without the framework, I also find Nitron to be very handy to build pure API service. Um, 
Um, we're looking forward to see more and more framework join and work together with us. And then similarly, in terms of bundled tools, um, so NAC2 has built on top of Webpack. And in NAC3, uh, we want to support Webpack for compatibility and easier migration for existing users, while also love the innovation and developer experience on Vit. So we try to support both tools interchangeably. We provide first-party integration for both Webpack and Vite, pre-configured for NUG, so ideally the app can work the same for both tools. Um, however, we know that the architecture as well as the plugin ecosystem are quite different between them. For example, if we, um, um, if we add some transformation to some modules in our pipeline, that usually means that we need to implement the logic twice for each plugin format um, as, a, as a Webpack loader or Vite plugin. So that, that basically doubles our work, um, as well as the effort for community modules to support them. So the initial, the initial motivation for us to create unplugging uh, a universal plugin interface for both Webpack and Vite. And with that, we are able to save a lot of efforts digging into the details or misalignment for each tool. And since unplugging get extracted as a standalone tool, it also forms its own community and is band scoped to support, other build, uh, to support ad, other build tools like Roll-Up, ESBuild, RSPack, Rolldown, Farm, Bound plugins even, and possibly more in the future. So with the work done by the Unplugin community, it also opens the door for meta framework like Nux to support more, uh, more build tools for a wider community uh, in the future. So those are just two examples. And we also, have, uh, we also have the UnJS community that provides high quality tools throughout the JavaScript ecosystem. And actually, Nitrom and uh, Unplugins are act a part of the UnJS community. And we also have VNode that's made from the uh, NUX server side code executor and later becomes the core engine of VTest that made it possible. And those tools are created from NUX knee. And later, we extract them to, be, to make them universal. And since then, uh, they have formed their own community and ecosystem that can benefit a wider range of the users and scenario. And Nux can still be the opinionated uh, view specific framework that providing better developer experience, while the underlying tool can be shared and collaborated with the other framework and community. And that's where it makes open source amazing, isn't it? So um, different from set intersection, uh, that's what we were talking about. I'd call it the set union. We extract the universal part, expand the scope, and grow with the community. And eventually, uh, they will benefit back to ourselves. And to have a more example related to React, uh, see, I'm really trying to relate it to React. And uh, I'd pick chocolate UI. Uh, I got a pleasure to talk with this creator, Sage, to get a more deep inside of the story uh, behind it. So back in 2019, uh, Chocolate UI was created as a view, uh, sorry, <laughs> as a React component library. And soon, someone from the, from the view ecosystem also made a view version, and they decided to make it official as Chocolate UI view. And over time, they find that maintaining two framework support is basically duplica duplicating the work, and it requires a lot of effort to keep uh, the features in sync. And in, in 2021, they come up with Zach. Uh, have you heard about it? OK. Uh, it's a universal uh, state machine library to extract and share the code logic for components across framework, and which works for uh, Valina JavaScript and also provided binding for uh, React, Vue, and Solid. And then in 2022, they come up with Panda CSS to extract their CSS in JS solution into a compile time uh, universal solution that has first class integration for basically every meta framework out there, uh, like Astro, Nux, uh, Remix, uh, a lot more. And with those building blocks, they, 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 um, they later make Arc UI, a headless components libraries built on top of Zach, and to provide a more user-facing components interface for that also support React, Solid, and Vue. And this year, they are migrating the next version of Chakra UI to use Arc and Panda under the hood. 
And once it's done, uh, it'll make the chakra uh, more, has a more solid foundation inherent from the work uh, made, in Zag, in, made in Zag and Arc. Uh, while it also becomes much more easy to maintain across, uh, across different frameworks. So in this case, uh, chakra UI itself can keep being specific, can keep being styled, opinionated components, but with a better core. Uh, while the tools uh, they build along the way um, could it become the general solution. And this approach is especially great um, for new rising frameworks to get more ecosystem without, uh, without actually uh, putting too much effort. And so this is something uh, I really love to see. So to wrap up with today's topic, uh, we brought up the idea that I call the set theory. I hope it's more clear now. So it composed with two sections, uh, the set intersection and set union. Um, in the intersection, we learned that uh, we shouldn't limit our project to being a one, uh, only being an in, inside a niche spot. We should pro proactively seek for the possibility to, to make our project more universal by breaking the circles and enlarge our scope. And for the union, uh, we learned that even sometimes we have to be specific in, in order to achieve something great. We could still seek for a potential union for our underlying tool to expand the community and benefit the whole ecosystem. So it's all about collaboration and communities. And I have a strong belief that in open source, um, this is one of the ways for us to build a better world. And I'm looking forward to see more and more open source build with a similar mindset and find a better way to collaborate. And yeah, that's all for my talk. I hope you enjoy. Thank you.